right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the world's most exciting classroom. My name is Joe Borowski, and I'll be your host for today. We have a lot to catch up on today, and we have a lot uh, of great speakers joining us uh, as well. So what are we going to do today? We're going to spend a little time uh, talking about conservation in Chile. We are going to head to the uh, National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth, where they've put together a great virtual lesson for us, uh, which we are going to share. We'll have some Kahoot action. And let's start off right now by catching up on where the ship is in the world. So bear with me for a moment while I share my screen and let's catch up uh, on where we are. Oh, actually the share screen is not cooperating with me right now, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll skip the map for now. If I can get the share screen working a little bit later, we'll jump uh, into that. But you know right now that we are in conception, but we won't be there for much longer. We only have a couple days there. So over the past week, since we last connected with Sehi, who was on board the ship uh, and was one of the Darwin leaders, she sailed on the last leg through the Chilean fjords. Um, and she told us about the new Darwin leaders coming on board. So there were two leaders coming on board uh, for this part uh, of the journey while we were in port in conception. And they're just actually wrapping up their projects today. Uh, and we'll be leaving the ship and then the new guests come on board for the next leg. It's just a little short leg along the coast uh, to Bella Paricio. Uh, and then we're going to be there for a few days before we we move on and start making our way towards uh, Callao in uh, Peru. So that's what we have going on. We may have the ship beam in with us at some stage and say he will give us a little bit of an update uh, to see how the week was going. Uh, but I think they might have been having a touch of trouble with the connectivity this morning. So we'll see what happens with that. But we've got to get right into it because we have a few guests joining us today. Uh, and our first guest joining us is Guillermo uh, Sapach. He is the strategy director of uh, Fundacion Rewilding Chile, which is a legacy uh, of Tompkins Conservation. So they are doing absolutely amazing work uh, conserving the native wildlife in Chile uh, and reintroducing species back into the wild. So let me grab Guillermo here now and see how he's doing today. Hey, Guillermo, how are you doing today? Hey, Joe. Doing very well. Thank you. Excellent. Well, it's absolutely great to have you with us. Where are you located? What part of the country are you in? Well, I'm in uh, Puerto Varas. This is northern Patagonia in mm -hmm. southern Chile. And uh, here we have our main office. And from here we work to the root of parks of Patagonia. All right. And a question for you before we get started, because I think, you know, we've spent the last couple months actually kind of going along Argentinian Patagonia. And then we've hit kind of Punta Arenas, and then we've been coming back up along the coast again. How far does Patagonia officially stretch uh, up South America? Um, do you work in kilometers or miles, first of all? Uh, I think most Tunian probably kilometers will work. Kilometers. Well, you have to think that there is, um, in a straight line uh, from where we are to the end of the, you know, American continent, it's about... Uh, 1,000 or probably 1,500 kilometers. Yeah. Um, but if you if you were to sail around the fjords and ride your you know vehicle, because there are some parts that you cannot connect through just only by by road, you have to sure. do a combination. It will be around uh, 2,800 kilometers. Okay. It's a wow. very very far away and and long route. A big part of the planet, absolutely. Well, Guillermo, I am excited to have you joining us. We've done some some work with some of your teammates in the past, uh, and I'm really excited to dive into some of the work you're doing. Yeah, for me too. It's a very special to be with you today, and especially that you are, um, you know, playing tribute to Darwin, who was very important uh, for the conservation world and and for Chile and Patagonia. All right. Well, we're going to let you take over for a little bit. And after you've presented, we'll get some questions from those who are tuning in with us. Perfect. Great. All right. All right, Guillermo, if you want to load up your screen share, we'll we'll go from there. Uh, just give me a little bit, a little bit of time to yeah, yeah. share. And no worries. I see it loading backstage. Perfect. Okay, so we are rewilding Chile, the legacy of Tompkins conservation. Um, and in the photo, you can see our two founders, Douglas and Christine Tompkins, who came to Chile in the late 
90s uh, and um, you know they came from the entrepreneurship world and they made a 180 degrees change in their lives to just dedicate all they had and all their efforts uh, resources and connections to protect this this beautiful land where we are and and together uh, but first of all this is a map this is where we are um yeah, when i mentioned that i was in in puerto varas this is in the far north tip of the map in near puerto mont uh, where the first national park of the route of parks of patagonia is located it's called alder sandino and then it goes for this very beautiful and scenic and very wild landscape um all the way up to the cape horn point the la the latest you know point of of the the southernmost i guess uh, point of the uh, american continent and um and here we helped create seven national parks along with the chilean government uh with one of the most biggest land donation um, from a private entity to a state or to a country in history um which is uh, around in total has been around 520,000 hectares donated uh, which have been leveraged to by the Chilean state to around uh, 3.5 million hectares i know these numbers uh you know um, sometimes are very hard to to imagine but it is is a big chunk of land that we've helped protect and and uh, in the most uh, strict way of protection which is national parks um, and we've also um, you know we don't stop in creating national parks which i will uh, just talk a little bit of, of our rewinding model because after we've created these national parks we've realized that we also need to restore this ecosystem right because these are not just paper parks these are not like just uh, you know lines that we draw in uh, imaginary maps they're actually very vibrant and healthy ecosystems and sometimes if they've lost some of their components of, of their uh, species or, or ecosystem process. So another part of our work is ecological restoration. We help uh, through um, rewilding and, and, uh, and I will definitely talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, uh, but that's a very important part of, of our vision of our work. Uh, and we also do a lot of community outreach work because we are very convinced that conservation cannot thrive without the involvement uh, and participation of local communities especially the ones that live around the national parks uh, and so i will quickly show you some pictures of the seven national parks that we have helped create these are uh, pumalin douglas Tompkins national park uh, which was named uh, after the our one of our founders uh, douglas Tompkins. It's a very wild place. This is one of the largest national parks in the in the southern corn. Then we have Corcovado National Park. Again, very pristine, very wild place in the world. Melimoyu National Park, same. Uh, then the Cerro Castillo National Park, which was actually a national reserve before, but uh, an, along with our agreement with the Chilean government, we managed to reconvert this land from a national reserve which is a lower category of conservation to a national park which is a very uh, it's a more powerful more permanent and strict way of protecting the land uh, and patagonia national park is where our maybe one of the most iconic parks for us because this was used to be a a very large sheep ranch that was very degraded after maybe a hundred years of overgrazing and now we have this new national park where most of our of our species rewilding efforts are taking place um, and as well as Kawashkar National Park which was a, a, again a, a national reserve that was reconfigured to become a national park um, and Yendigaya National Park this is a, a one of the first uh, parks we helped create back in the 2000s and Ornopiren um yeah these are very wild places very remote very hard to get some of them have no connectivity so they have been uh, uh you know we've helped uh, protect these these last pieces of 
untouched wilderness in the world. And um, I just wanted to further develop the wildlife program that we run and, and tell you something a little bit more about our, our main species that we work with. Because um, as, I, as I mentioned, we, we believe and, and as a rewilding organization, you know, rewilding is all about complete functional ecosystem, recovering the health of the ecosystem and of nature. Not only, you know, drawing lines around the maps and, and, and declaring them national parks, which is very important too, but we also have to take a step further and actually protect their main um, ecosystem uh, and their main uh, species and, and roles that they had or that they've been, uh, you know, for some reason that they've, that has been lost. So we work with the uh, with the Wemul deer or Southern Andean deer, which is the, the unfortunately the most threatened deer species in the world, um, and we're uh, trying to protect it because it's it's been very very degraded as a species. It came down from uh, you know it only fifteen hundred individuals survive in the wild and. Uh, we believe that we can, you know, maintain their population, but also we're trying to work with the government to uh, try to increase their connectivity and help to increase their numbers so they can come back. The same with condors. Condors maybe are not that threatened. The Andean condor this is the longest, the largest uh, land bird there is, and uh, we help them in the, in the rehabilitation and and release into the wild so we release them in national in the patagonia national park we just released four of, of them last week and um, we work with all kind of actors and stakeholders to promote the conservation of this very emblematic bird and we also work with the puma which is very important because this is this is the top predator of patagonia and and uh, and you know pumas play a very important role in maintaining the entire food webs of this uh, terrestrial ecosystem by keeping the other species in check uh, especially their main prey like the wanaco and also the the smaller carnivores so if if the puma wasn't there it would be very harmful for the entire ecosystem because it would, you know, that would entail the rise of some imbalances in the in the ecosystem, and so the puma helps to keep that in check. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to expand a little bit more on two of the species that we work with, that are that were actually uh, named after Darwin, and um, because he helped uh, to to um, describe these species and. Uh, and you know, and in a way, discovered them to the science uh, when he came to to Patagonia. I think he spent like, around like three months in um, in Patagonia. That's an interesting fact that we could check. Uh, but here, the video is playing. Um, this is the landscape of Patagonia National Park. It's dominated by the steppe ecosystem. One of the, few, the one of the few steppe ecosystems that have been restored in the world. And, um, and every year we work to reinforce the population of Darwin rea, uh, as you can see in the video, because they, they play a very important role in, in the dispersal of seeds. They're considered ecosystem engineers, so they help to shape the, the, the steppe ecosystem. And, uh, and so we collaborate with other stakeholders to uh, bring them uh, to the park to breathe them in other places. And um, I will just uh, fast forward this part. And, and so, yeah, and so when we started working in Patagonia National Park, there were only 20 individuals left. And nowadays, the last count that we run, we counted around 70, uh, which is a very hopeful number to fulfill uh, and, and to work towards our goal, which is to have a viable population of these important animals. And, and then 
I will want I wanted to talk about another species that is very important uh, that maybe is not located in the Patagonia National Park but is in the northern part of Patagonia, which is the Darwin's frog or the Rhinoderma darwini, also discovered by Charles Darwin when he was around this area. Um, and this is a very, very important species. It's also threatened um, and by the IUCN red list, uh, listed as endangered. And this frog is very interesting because it's the only species within the realm of amphibians or frogs that the male um, the, the has a male brooding uh, strategy for for you know mating so the male would keep the tadpoles in within his vocal sac to raise them um, you know while the female uh, looks for food and resources and, and so this is a very interesting animal. It has this, this unique behavior and um, is very beautiful, has a very interesting uh, color patterns. And, and again, um, as you may, may have heard, as frogs and amphibians are very threatened by the climate changing conditions, and especially by global warming, because they're, they need wet and humid environments to survive. So we are starting to look at them to comprehend their their, um, their ecology to try to protect them. And um, and yeah, it was very interesting that it was discovered by by Charles Darwin as well. And so yeah, I think that's the presentation that I had uh, for you guys. And um, all right. Yeah. Well, answer some of, questions you have. Yeah, first of all, Guillermo, you live in an absolutely incredible part of the planet. Uh, those national parks that you show, those wild, wild areas are just absolutely stunning. Uh, I assume that you get to spend lots of time out in the field checking up on projects and things like that? Yes, for sure. Our, our work is, is a lot in the field. Yeah. And then I noticed the species you selected, I think you could... You could count most of them as as ecosystem engineers or you know umbrella species. If you protect them, you're protecting you know other species. So uh, I imagine you're very intentional with which species you choose as kind of your flagship projects. Yeah, they're they're usually we work with with what's is known as keystone species, right? So the keystone species are these species that. Uh, despite their low abundance, their low numbers, they play a very important role in their entire ecosystem. Um, and although, yeah, we've, we've, uh, we work with these species, our intent or our objective is towards the entire ecosystem, not only the individual species. So that's why we have to, you know, work with, with the species that have a a you know either a top-down effect on the trophic web or that play important roles in as ecosystem engineers for sure yeah absolutely all right well those who are tuning in via youtube don't be uh, shy use the chat sidebar and send in some questions we'll start off with the first one here guillermo uh about tourism so uh do you know roughly how many tourists visit these parks each year and is it putting a lot of pressure on them um, I should know this this uh, piece of information, um, but I don't have the exact number. I do know that we had a very sharp decrease in tourism after COVID. Yeah. Um, but well, this is a very important. Uh, this is a very good question, you know, conceptually, because for one part, we are trying to promote tourism yeah. as a way to develop this area of the world from a more friendly way, not from an extractive perspective, which is mainly the vision of the country of, of, of Chile, you know, to focus on, on the extraction of, of you know, of, of resources. Mm -hmm. So we promote tourism for sure. And, um, and yeah, we have uh, in the national parks model, the, the it's very important to to allow for for people to to have these 
you know, connection with the land. Yeah. So we we have had to protect, uh, you know, focus on protecting these species too from from visitors. Uh, also protecting the visitors, for example, from from you know puma interaction. Um, and so definitely it's a, it's a work in progress for us to understand this relationship between, you know, wildlife and humans. Um, but in the larger scheme of things, we believe that tourism is a very important, um, you know, a very, very important part for to complement our conservation work. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's, you're probably always trying to find that balance between tourism because they bring, you know, money into the local economy. Uh, but at the same time, not putting too much pressure on those those beautiful ecosystems. Exactly. Yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. So another question here about the the local community. I know you know you mentioned Patagonia uh, National Park. It, it for years was used as as pasture and grazing area. So do you find that the the community is usually pretty accepting of of these new wild areas? Yeah, it's um, that's a very very interesting question. That's why we we uh, try to have a, a an involvement, a direct involvement from the communities with their with their natural parks. Um, and yeah, in the case of the Patagonia National Park, there was a very strong and there is a very strong cultural tie from the local way of living that is very connected to. You know how um, you know to to uh, wild. I mean, not wildlife. Uh, livestock management and livestock waves of 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 you know being connected to the land. Um, but what happened in Patagonia National Park is that after a hundred years of overgrazing, this land was actually very degraded. So the the ranch was almost like bankrupt. So couldn't start. Couldn't afford to keep on on working uh, and so it was a very you know it was a transition towards uh, conservation yeah. that that um, you know didn't follow major clashes between you know the local way of of uh, of living and right. the the way of conserving of this land yeah but uh, we still work today with a community outreach program in Patagonia to bring the national park and the importance of protecting this area to the local community. And we co-create with the local communities the program so they can, you know, feel uh, and get involved in the in the program themselves. Yeah, yeah, it it is such um, an important thing. Is you know people. Most people don't want to to damage the ecosystem around them because it's the place that they live. Really, you know, they just want to make sure that they're making uh, a, a good living for their family. And ecotourism and transitioning to that can be a, you know, a, a huge huge help to some of the the local communities, like the ranch example that you used. Exactly. Yeah. So, Guillermo, yeah. another question here. You obviously get to go out in the field. Uh, and and into these parks. So, is there a special experience you can share for us? Maybe a wildlife encounter or something that you know just uh, kind of fuels you and keeps you going. Oh, for sure. Well, there there are just so many of those. Uh, I think the, they are the you know the um, the reason af after why we we do what we do is just being out there in in the wilderness and and observing and understanding and protecting these species. Um, I guess the, the most, uh, you know, maybe dramatic uh, or, or impressive encounter that you can have when you are around uh, Patagonia and especially Patagonia National Park is seeing or coming up with a puma, uh, with a cougar puma. And, uh, and it's just so special because um, I was a, Personally, I was a volunteer myself before working with the Wild in Chile in the past. So I was helping to protect, uh, I mean, to create the, the Patagonia National Park, removing fences, removing invasive species, planting trees, and, and all this kind of uh, work that, um, you know, in the past, Tompkins Conservation had for, for the, the plan of creating the National Park. Uh, this was a maybe... Uh, 10 years ago, and um, it was very difficult to see a puma. It was very hard because 
you know, they had been driven to the outskirts of the of the land, and and um, and you knew that they were around, and you knew that you know the locals like knew their their habits, and they had seen them, but it was just very very difficult to see. And now that you know that the park is is, is a park after 2018 became a national park. We are seeing this flourishing of of Puma population, and and not I'm not gonna tell to you that it's a, it's a you know it's an everyday encounter. But you can if you spend a week or so in the park, you can you will definitely be able to see them, and um, and that you know that little success is very important for for us to keep us going uh, to know that the efforts you know they don't have to it doesn't have to you know take a hundred years to bring maybe an entire health ecosystem back and you can see small results like the puma coming back and and yeah we we see them um, fairly often right now and 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 it's very rewarding for sure I think you're mute, Joe. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's amazing. I, I thought maybe you'd use puma as an example because they're such an amazing species. Um, and you know, other places in the world, you could you could go around, live there your whole life and never see them. So what an opportunity to be able to to see them in the wild, see them in the space, and and witness their recovery. Uh, it's amazing, Guillermo. Yeah, for you guys sure. Are doing, yeah, you're doing incredible work with rewilding Chile. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you joining us today and sharing some of that work with us. Um, yeah, we're going to have to have maybe you join us uh, another time throughout the journey because it is such great conservation work and we've just scratched the surface of some of those stories. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's been my pleasure, Joe, and it'd be great to come back and talk a, a little bit more about other aspects of our work, maybe. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Well, Guillermo, thank you so much for being with us today on the World's Most Exciting Classroom. Have a great rest of the week, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot, Joe, and we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, Guillermo. Bye-bye. All right. So in just a minute, we are going to jump to a Kahoot quiz. While Guillermo, or Guillermo was presenting, uh, I pulled together a little Kahoot quiz behind the scenes. But before we do, we have our live connection coming up right now uh, with Uster Scalde. As we know, it's in Concepcion. So let's bring Sehi in right now. Hi, Sehi. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Joe? Good, good. It's good to see you. It looks beautifully sunny there right now. Oh, it's the perfect weather. Um, we've got calm seas, no wind, um, really sunny. It's the, the perfect day to be uh, on, the, on the ship. All right. And I know today is a transition day. So our Darwin leaders, I think, are wrapping up and leaving the ship today. Uh, and then you'll be setting sail soon with some new passengers. Yeah, that's right. Yesterday we had uh, the Darwin presentation with um, Daniel and Agustin who did their projects with sea otters and dolphins. We had yeah. some special guests coming from the regional office, regional ministry of conservation in Concepcion um, and, and, and other guests that has helped us with their projects. And that was a huge success. Um, we wrapped that event up yesterday and today we're making sure the ship is uh, ready to welcome passengers tomorrow. All right. Say, so, hey, can I get you to just maybe move the camera just slightly? We're getting a little sun glare. We want to be able to see you. Let me there show you. Beautiful. Perfect. Let's take a look at the ship. Oh, she's beautiful. Right? Yeah. I can't wait. I'm going to catch up with it in a few weeks in, in Peru and then sail to Ecuador. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. So, Sehi, uh, you mentioned the two projects, and and sea otters is obviously one uh, uh, close to my heart. I love I love sea otters; they're such a cool species. Were you able to get out in the field at all this week? Yes, yes. Um, I know that Daniel was. Um, I went on the field with Daniel and Josh, who were working on that on that project. And on yeah. out of the three field work days, on the first day, they went in the water. It was really cold. They needed to get some thick wet suits, but nonetheless, they did able, they were able to see some sea otters in the wild, which was super, super cool. Um, they got some nice clips and we're excited to put them in the, in the films that we're going to premiere soon. Oh, amazing. We can't wait to share those, which of course we're going to do at some stage. Uh, and how did the other project go? Yeah, so about the dolphin. So there is a species called the Chilean dolphin. And it's an endemic species that only live in Chile. Not many people actually, 
not many Chileans know that there's an endemic species of of Chilean dolphins. And um, yeah, Agustin did a really great project about raising awareness amongst the Chilean people about this population, talking to the fishermen about um, how they interact with the dolphins, um, and also, yeah, just observing them. Agustin was surprised to find that, well, actually, the Chilean dolphin is known to be kind of a shy species, they said. Mm -hmm. But when they went out into the field, I think in all the days that they went out in the field, they saw hundreds and hundreds of, of wow. dolphins just jumping all over the bow, riding on the bowsprit, um, which is super cool because it's a small, um, small uh, species. Um, I think there's only, uh, I don't know, a couple thousand in the wild, and they were able to see hundreds, which is super, super cool. It's, we have some amazing shots coming up. Oh, absolutely amazing. We can't wait to share uh, both of their videos when when they're ready. That's awesome. So, Zahi, what, yeah. what, what, what's next for you now? I, I know I don't think you're sailing on the next little leg, but when are you catching up with the ship next? Yeah, I'm going to be um, helping out with the upcoming port in Valparaiso. We have mm -hmm. two projects. Um, with two Darwin leaders from the United States. Um, one is on the effect, the interaction between feral or wild dogs um, and the native habitat. And another project, we have one um, on human impact of, of these um, campers who, who camp in the wild. So we're, it's, it's a bit of a different take than the, the species focused projects that we've done in the past, but we're really, yeah. we're all about trying new things, exploring um, new angles to tell stories about conservation. So we're really excited about that. All right. Well, Sehi, I'm so glad you were able to pop in and give us a little update. And here in Canada, it's very, I mean, we had some hail last night and, and rain. So uh, that nice warm weather is nice to see. Uh, if you don't mind, maybe give us one more. I'm going to go full screen. Give us another pan around the, the Ooster Scalby. Oh, Scalbi. absolutely. Yeah. Oh, look at this. Got the mast. Uh, we have the crew working very hard to clean the ship. Um, we have some people climbing up the, the rigging all the way up. I don't know if you can see all the way up into the mast, cleaning yeah. things, uh, polishing. Um, yeah, we have, a, we have a nice little tent that we have um, just to hang around, uh, just to socialize a little bit in between the, the shifts, uh, cleaning. Yeah, and there's the nice little Dutch flag at the end. That's, yeah. All right, very cool. Well, it's a short little leg this time uh, before our next uh, destination, but- Yeah, we need uh, four days. Yeah, we can't wait to connect next week uh, during the next World's Most Exciting Classroom. Sehi, thank you so much for jumping in with us and giving us a little taste of what ship life is like today. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Have a good one. All right. Thanks, Sehi. We'll talk to you later. Bye. All right. So let us get to that promised Kahoot quiz. Bear with me for just a moment uh, while I share my screen. Uh, it's just going to take a second to kick in here. Uh, and then we will jump right in together. So uh, here we go. Share screen and Kahoot. There we go. You should see that coming up now. You need to go to Kahoot.it today. Kahoot.it. And then it's going to ask you for a PIN number. You need to put in 206-3318. Now, if you're lucky enough to have a device at your desk, maybe a tablet or a Chromebook, you can join that way. If not, your teacher could pop this up at the front of the classroom for you. Uh, and you could shout out your answers to him or her. If you are joining us from home today as a classroom or a student, you can scan that QR code. Uh, and it is going to bring you right in directly. You won't have to put in uh, that code for us. So as we wait for a couple classrooms or uh, some individual students to join us, I can see some joining already. We will talk very, very briefly about what we're gonna do to wrap up today. So we have to talk just for a minute about our slime experiment from two weeks ago that the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth set up for us. We have a really cool and easy experiment for this week that we will run through together. And then uh, we have a little visit from the National Marine Aquarium. So we still have lots to get to today. So I'm going to give it just a minute here uh, to load up for us. And in fact, maybe while students are joining, we'll, I'm just going to talk briefly about the, the slime experiment because we don't really have results to share today. It was more something for students to try uh, and share uh, in their classroom or to try at home. So. Two weeks ago, we were at the National Marine Aquarium. We learned all about clownfish and the real story of Nemo. Because what happened in our Disney Pixar movie is not quite what would have happened in real life. And then we learned about how they live in the sea anemones and they need that slime protection on their body so they don't get stung. 
So how weird would it be if every time you went into your home, you had to cover yourself in slime to protect you from your house? Uh, that is what the clownfish have to do. Uh, and Becky, two weeks ago, we, built, we made some of that slime together with her at the National Marine Aquarium. Uh, as an example of just what it was like. So no results to share because it was more of a fun experiment just for you guys to try uh, in your classrooms or to try at home. So it looks like we have some students ready to go. Let's get live into this right away here. And then we'll have our little bit from the National Marine Aquarium. All right, first question coming your way. How many national parks has rewilding Chile helped create? Was it three? five, seven, or 10. So how many national parks uh, has Rewilding Chile helped create? Three, five, seven, or 10. You have a few more seconds to get your answer locked in. Remember, you want the right answer, but the quicker you can put that correct answer in, the more points you are going to get. It was three, five, seven, or 10 national parks. All right, good job crew. They have helped create seven uh, national parks to date. So the space bee is in first place and we go on to our next question. This is a true or false. Restoring ecosystems is an important step after national park formation. Is that true or is that false? That restoring ecosystems is an important step after national park formation, true uh, or false? You have about 10 seconds to get that answer locked in important step restoring those ecosystems all right no question that is true especially parks like the ones created that may have been used in the past as as grazing ground and such there's a lot of plant species and animal species that might be missing so with a little bit of help nature can be really resilient uh, and bounce back so the space bee holding on tight not wanting to let go which isn't an example of rewilding's priority animal projects so which animal project did they not share with us today? Which isn't a priority? The puma, the steamer duck, the condor, or the rhea? You can see a little hint there decoding for you on the screen. But which one wasn't one of the priority projects? The puma, the steamer duck, the condor, or the rhea? Got about 10 more seconds to get that answer locked in. All right, so it was in fact the steamer duck. The puma, the condor, the rhea were three examples of priority rewilding projects. And the steamer duck, although it's not a priority project, is still being protected. Because if you protect species like the puma, like the condor, like Darwin's rhea, that need large spaces, that need, that spread seeds around as ecosystem engineers and things like that, then you're protecting a whole bunch of other species. So even though they're focusing on maybe seven or so main projects, it still has a massive impact uh, on the whole ecosystem. All right, next question, true or false? Pumas aren't important species in the Patagonian ecosystem. So true or false, pumas are not important species in the Patagonian ecosystem. True or false? Few more seconds to get your answer in. All right, that couldn't be more false. The puma is a keystone species. Even though there aren't thousands of them, they still play an important role, keeping populations in check of their prey species. So very important ecosystem balancers, those pumas. All right, space B, holding on, last question. Darwin's rhea is considered an ecosystem engineer because they disperse seeds, they keep pests low, they keep out invasive species, or they are a prey species. So we saw a nice little video clip of the Darwin's rhea. We know their population has gone from 20 to 70, which is a great start. So are they dispersing seeds, keeping pests low, keeping out invasive species, or are they prey species? All right. They are dispersing seeds. They're ecosystem engineers. The food that they eat, those seeds don't digest. When they walk through the ecosystem and they poop, they leave those seeds behind with a little bit of fertilizer uh, to grow in new areas. Very cool. Okay, let's look at our podium. Third place, we've got the amusing egret. 
In second place, the fabulous Bison. And holding down that top spot, the Space Bee held on all the way through. Good stuff. All right, I'm gonna come back from that screen share uh, and we are going to jump into uh, our little next guest portion. So if you are the Space B, if that's your classroom, you need to send uh, a message. We'll send it to classroom at darwin200.com. So send a message to classroom at darwin200.com and we'll make sure we get a prize heading your way. So congratulations to the Space B, uh, classroom at darwin200.com. All right. So the a couple of weeks ago, our curiosity of the week was provided by the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth. And they had these beautiful, sometimes they're called mermaids purses, but they are shark eggs. So some sharks have live birth, but some sharks lay eggs and they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes and varieties. So we thought it'd be cool if the aquarium gave us a little more in-depth look at these amazing shark eggs and, and cases uh, that are produced. So that's what we have on deck here as we're getting closer to wrapping up. We're going to play a little clip here from... Uh, the National Marine Aquarium highlighting those amazing shark eggs and shark cases. So here we go. I'm going to share this video. It should come up right about now. Hello again, guys. This is Georgia at the Ocean Conservation Trust. And we are back here again to talk to you about our egg cases. And this was your curiosity of the week a couple of weeks ago. We told you the answer in last week's episode. And today we're going to give you a little bit more information about them. So we're just going to zoom in on these egg cases in case you haven't seen them before. And these have come from a mixture of sharks and rays. But not all sharks and rays reproduce in this way. This is one of three ways that sharks and rays can reproduce. Some sharks and rays, like the sandbar sharks here that we have at the National Marine Aquarium, reproduce in a way similar to other mammals like humans. The embryo is inside the womb and lives off an umbilical cord attached to the mother until they're ready to be born. This is called viviparity. Our sand tiger sharks like these here are one species of shark and ray that do it a little differently. They're in the womb, but they stay connected to the yolk from their egg, rather than being connected to the mother's body for nutrients. In these sharks, they often start out with many eggs in the womb, but only a small number are actually born as live births. Do you know or can you guess why? The baby sharks are cannibals. The first sharks to hatch eat the other eggs in the womb because they need the nutrients that they're not getting from an umbilical cord. This is called ovoviparity. And the third and final type of reproduction in sharks and rays is called oviparity. This is the type of reproduction that uses the egg cases. So here we have an ID guide, which we have downloaded from the Shark Trust and they run a really cool egg case hunt. Um, they're based here in the UK. And we have got a couple of examples of egg cases and we're gonna talk to you about how you can tell if they come from a skate or a ray or from a shark. So this top example here we've got is from a ray or a skate. And we know this by using our ID guide because the shape of the capsule is very similar. It's a lot wider than those from sharks. And it's also got these horns at either end. And this is how our ray will attach their egg case to some kind of substrate, maybe a rock, to keep it from uh, floating away with the currents. And then if we have a look at these ones down the bottom, these examples come from some sharks instead. So we can see that the capsule shape is very different. It's much longer. And instead of having those pointy horns at the end, instead they've got these tangled parts, which are, um, they have a different name. These are called the tendrils. So on this one here, the tendrils, they are still attached to our egg case. Whereas on this one, the tendrils have come apart. But the tendrils are the part of the egg case from the shark that will help to attach the egg case to a substrate or a rock to stop the egg case from floating away. 
So we have got a couple of examples of egg cases that we have uh, acquired from our animals here at the aquarium and some that people have found on local beaches. And we're going to use our guide from the Shark Trust to help us identify what species they might have come from. However, if you were to do this at home and if you don't live in the UK, you can find online maybe a local species guide that you could use instead because you might have different species of sharks and rays in your local area. We can use this guide to try and work out what species our egg cases have likely come from. But if you do find any egg cases at the beach, it is really useful to soak these in water first before you try and identify them. This can help the texture of the egg case go back to normal to see what it would have been like when it was floating around in the ocean. And it will help you to measure the, length, the real length of the egg case before trying to identify the species. Now, one thing that's really important to mention, if you do find egg cases at the beach, please make sure that they are empty before you take them home. If by any chance you find an egg case that does have a little baby inside of it still, then please pop that back in the sea and try and weight it down with something so that it doesn't float to the surface of the water. Now, the egg cases we have here are very varied in their size. So if we start off with this one here, we can try and identify the species it has come from. Now we haven't soaked these, but here at the aquarium we have got lots of these blonde rays. So it's likely by the colour and the size of our egg case, this has come from our, one of our blonde ray mothers. Then we have got this ginormous egg case here, this is much bigger than our blonde ray egg case. And this has come from one of these guys here. It's come from a flapper skate. And these are much bigger in size than our blonde rays. And we can tell that these from, are from our skates and rays because of that shape of the capsule and those horns on the ends of the egg case. But if we have a look at the bottom of our ID guide, we can see here that we have got some egg cases from, from some sharks. Now, this tiny little one here with the tendrils on the end, we think has come from one of our lovely cat sharks in the aquarium. And as I said, it's still got those little tendrils attached. Now, this one next to the cat shark egg case is much bigger in size. And we think from the shape and the colour and the size, it's probably from a nurse hound. Some other egg cases look slightly different in their shape and size. So this one here has like a corkscrew shape, like a helical structure. And this helps the shark to kind of uh, pop that into a little gap in between the rocks and it can screw that shark egg in to keep it nice and safe away from any predators. Now this egg case has come from a horn shark, probably a Port Jackson shark, and they are super cool if you look them up. So this tank here, this is our Eddystone tank here at the aquarium. And it's based on a rocky reef called the Eddystone Reef off the coast of Plymouth in the UK. And it's home to lots of our local species of sharks and rays. We've got some cat sharks, nurse hounds, which are sometimes called bull hush sharks, blonde rays, undulate rays and thornback rays. And all of these species reproduce by producing those egg cases that we've been talking about. So cat sharks, they reproduce by producing the egg cases. This is a young juvenile cat shark born here at the aquarium. And when our grown up uh, sharks and rays reproduce, they'll lay their egg cases and they'll put them somewhere in the tank and they like to wrap the uh, tendrils or the horns of the egg case around the rocks and around the corals in the tank to keep them nice and safe. When our divers go into the tanks, they'll collect those egg cases and take them to the nursery. And it can take between six to nine months for the egg cases to develop before uh, they reveal our lovely baby sharks and rays inside. This baby cat shark is a few months old and it shares the tank with a Dover sole flatfish 
and a ray hiding under the sand. I wonder if anyone can spot where this baby ray is hiding. So we joined one of our biologists called Rebecca to feed our baby cat shark and ray. And they like to eat shrimp called superba shrimp and occasionally a little bit of squid. And we fed the cat shark first. And that cheeky Dover soul, they need to be fed pretty quickly to keep them occupied so that we can feed the ray. Otherwise, they'll try and steal the ray's food. And lastly, we fed our ray. So they will gently take their little piece of food and get it to their mouth on the underside of their body. Unfortunately, lots of species of sharks and rays are threatened by things such as finning and overfishing. However, sharks and rays are super important for healthy oceans. Sharks are keystone species, meaning that they help to keep other populations of animals in check by eating the old or the unwell fish. But what can you do to help conserve species of sharks and rays? You can make sure that you don't use any products that might contain shark or ray products. You can help to keep the ocean clean by reducing, reusing and recycling any waste where possible, especially plastics. And lastly, you can do your best to learn lots of cool facts about sharks and then share your knowledge with other people so that they care and they want to conserve sharks and rays too. We really hope you've enjoyed hearing about some egg cases from sharks and rays here at the National Marine Aquarium. Maybe the next time you're by the coast, you could see if you can find some for yourself. In the UK, the Shark Trust, they love it when people get involved in their great egg case hunt. And they use that data for their conservation work. But if you don't live in the UK, you could see if there is another charity that does similar work and get involved with that. See you again soon. All right. So a huge shout out to Georgia and the team at the, the Ocean Conservation Trust at the National Marine uh, Aquarium in Plymouth. So a little bit of a deep dive from our curiosity, looking at the egg cases to a, more information about it. And then getting that nice behind the scenes look at the aquarium where they feed some of their young sharks uh, and some of their young rays. So very grateful uh, to the National Marine Aquarium for that great video clip today. Uh, our experiment. So this experiment today is a short little video clip. Um, I did it. I didn't do, I'm not going to do it live today because I had to do it up in my kitchen because I needed a hot surface. So this video clip uh, is our experiment and we are going to crush a can today without squeezing it or putting anything on top of it. We're going to use the power of water uh, and air. So that's a little hint for how it's done. Let's take a look at the experiment uh, and then we'll talk about it. All right, we've got a nice and simple experiment for you here today. Uh, I'm in my kitchen because I don't have a hot surface in my office. And today I'm going to crush a can without touching it, squishing it with my hands. 
So a few things that we need, definitely an adult supervision experiment this time around because you need a hot surface, maybe something like a stove top or a lot of schools in the classroom have hot plates for science experiments. So a hot plate will work really well if you're doing this in the classroom. You need a bowl of really cold water, which I have conveniently right here. You also need a pop can, maybe something like an aluminum Coke can that you can put about an inch of water into the bottom and you need a handy pair of tongs here. So what I'm gonna do, I'm going to turn on my stove top on high. Maybe you're using a hot plate, you'll do the same thing with your hot plate. And then you're gonna put your can in like that. So I'm using a pot. You could probably do it with a frying pan as well. You just don't wanna put it right onto the stove surface. If you're using a hot plate, then it doesn't really matter. You can put the can right uh, onto the hot plate. And now we are gonna wait for the water in the Coke can to boil. All right, so if we listen in nice and closely here, you can hear some popping sounds. That water has started to boil. There's some steam starting to come out. So I think we might just be ready here with our Coke can and our boiling water. So what are we gonna do now? We are going to take our bowl of really cold water. We are going to use our tongs and we're gonna carefully take our aluminum can and we're gonna dump it upside down, right dip the top into this bowl of cold water and let's see what happens. There we go. Oops. A little hard to get a hold of now that it's been crushed. But there we go, there is our Coke can. Let's get this water out. It has now been nicely crushed. All right, so there is our experiment of the week. This is one where you definitely need some help from an adult, maybe something your teacher could demonstrate at the front of the classroom with a hot plate, which oftentimes schools have for experiments and science labs and things like that. Uh, or you could do it at home uh, with somebody at home, maybe uh, your mom or your dad, uh, aunt, uncle, grandma, grandpa, whoever's around, uh, and you can try that experiment out for yourself. So you have two weeks to take a picture doing that experiment, classroomatdarwin200.com. Send your results to us. Do a little video clip if you want, or just send a picture, classroomatdarwin200.com. Two weeks to send in your results. And then if you want, in the email, just add a little line. What do you think happened? Why do you think the can went from nice and intact to crushing when it moved uh, into that colder water? So we'd love to hear what you think about that. So the last thing we have to do today before we wrap up is... Um, our curiosity of the week. So last week's curiosity, I have it right here with me in my office. You can see it's pretty big. And let's try and stretch it. Go all the way top to bottom like that. So we had many guesses come in, including Mrs. Blaney's class in uh, Linwood, Ontario, her grade sixes. And their guess was that it was some kind of a torch. Uh, we had a few other guesses as well. And um, it, it actually is not. This is something I got in Australia. This is called a didgeridoo. And so this is something um, that the uh, Aborigine culture that they, they make, uh, and it is a wonderful instrument, a wonderful musical instrument. Traditionally, it's made when a branch falls off of a tree and it's left to be hollowed out by ants and termites. And then by blowing in the top, it resonates through the long... Uh, tube and just makes these incredible sounds. Now, mine is more of a decorative piece uh, in my office. It's something to remember the year I spent living in Australia. You can see it has a platypus uh, etched into it. Um, yeah, I got this in Queensland in Australia. And so that's what it is. It is a didgeridoo. Um, I'll try to make it make some sound. I haven't tried to play it for a while. So let's see if I can make it make a little bit of sound here for us. <laughs> Not really. You put the end up a little bit. Try one more time. All right. Not so great. But 
please do yourself a favor and go on YouTube and look at what a proper player can do. It's absolutely amazing the sounds that come out of it. Uh, so definitely do check that out. A didgeridoo from Australia was our curiosity of the week from last week. And let's wrap up with this week's curiosity. Uh, I have it here in my office. This might be a little bit of a tough one. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a clue to help you figure it out. But here is this week's curiosity. It's heavy. It is kind of curved on one side, kind of like a little bit of a crescent shape. It's got these two pass-through spots here. It's got the number eight on it, and that's because it weighs uh, eight pounds. So what is this? That is your question, the curiosity of the week. I'm going to give you a little bit of a hint. It is something I absolutely love to do. In fact, probably one of my favorite things to do. This is an important component of that. And if you go to the world's uh, most exciting classroom, episode 12, and watch some of episode 12, you will get a nice little clue as to what this might be used for, what activity this might be used in. So you have one week to send your answers into classroom at darwin200.com. What is this? It is heavy. It is a little bit of a crescent shape. It has these pass-throughs. It weighs eight pounds. What is this? All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. A huge shout-out to Sehi for joining us from the Uster Scal Day. Uh, a shout-out to Guillermo joining us from Fundacion uh, Rewilding Chile. And then, of course, a huge shout-out to the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth for that amazing little video about shark cases and a behind-the-scene look at how they care for their sharks and their rays. There's only one thing left to do today, and that is to thank our sponsors, to thank our partners, to thank our supporters, without whom we would not be able to do the world's most exciting classroom. We wouldn't be able to sail a tall ship uh, around the world following Darwin's voyage of the Beagle and beam that back to you. So here we go. Thank you to our sponsors. Have a great week, everyone. We will see you in next week's world's most exciting classroom. And here we go. Play us out.